Good morning. Welcome to this edition of the Rich Urban Show. We bring you news and views from the unification principle point of view. We're happy to have John Doyle on. He is running for state senator, District 16, against Patricia Rucker. So please introduce yourself. Thank you, Richard, and, and uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm John Doyle. I, uh, I grew up in Charlestown. I'm a graduate of Charlestown High School, you know, which, of course, predated even Jefferson High, uh, and uh, graduated from Shepherd University, where I majored in political science and minored in history, uh, served in the Army in Vietnam, uh, in the infantry, I have the uh, I, I have the combat infantry badge, which I wear on my lapel. Also, a bronze star for valor, uh, and uh, uh, I served in uh, uh, in sixty nine and uh, nineteen sixty nine and nineteen seventy. Uh, I was elected to the House of Delegates in nineteen eighty two, the first time. Served over a, a twenty six for twenty six years, over a forty year stretch in three different periods of time. Uh, and I also, for a three-year period, uh, between um, uh, uh, 20, uh, uh, 2013 and 2016, I was Deputy Secretary of Revenue uh, in the uh, second term of Governor Earl Ray Tomlin. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's pretty much my history. Uh, I, I stand for clean air and clean water. I stand for good public schools, emphasis on the public. Uh, I want to restore reproductive freedom to the women of West Virginia. I want us to have an elected public service commission because I think the current appointed public service commission is basically in the pocket of, of uh, uh, water and electric utilities, those mm -hmm. uh, regulated monopolies, and their job is to regulate them. And I think the way they've been going about it for many years is just whatever the utility wants, the utility gets. And, mm. and I think we need a public service commission that is more attuned to the needs of consumers. And I think we can get that if we have an elected public service commission. I also stand for something called your right to repair. If you, okay. buy, if you buy a product, computer, car, refrigerator, uh, tractor, you name it. Uh, under the current law in West Virginia and almost every other state. I'll get to that in a minute. The manufacturer is permitted to retain as proprietary information needed to repair the product if it breaks down. Now, if you're under warranty, you're going to go to the ma to the manufacturer and get it repaired for free, certainly. But once you're beyond the warranty period, if it breaks down, in some cases, you can repair it yourself if you have the information, the coded information. Or you might have your friendly neighborhood uh, independent repair person that you prefer to work with. Okay. But again, that person would need that coded information. Right now, they don't get it and you don't get it. Massachusetts, two years ago, passed a law that says if you buy a product, the manufacturer is required to give you that information. I think West Virginia should have such a law. Uh, Delegate Kayla Young from Canal County mm -hmm. for two years has sponsored a bill that would do this for agricultural equipment. And this has reached a crisis point in agriculture. Mm -hmm. If I'm elected, the bill I would introduce would apply to every product. So okay. that's All right. my background. That's my platform. And Okay, uh, great. Um, all right. So questions. what do you think? So you've enumerated a number of issues there and uh, we could talk about them more. What do you think the biggest issue is like in West Virginia right now? Oh, I think the biggest issue that will face the upcoming legislature is how to balance the budget, because I believe we're at the end of the period of big surpluses. These things go in cycles. Uh, when I was in the House of Delegates for 19 years, I was on the House Finance Committee, and I was vice chair of it for 10 years. And then that added to my time as Deputy Secretary of Revenue. And I've been in interviews with uh, uh, the New York bonding houses, Fitch and Moody's and that sort of stuff. The, the, the uh, budgetary cycle, the budgetary is cyclical with every state, as it is with ours. 
we go through periods where we have big surpluses. Then we go through periods where uh, we're scratching to put everything together. We're about to enter into a period where we're going to have to be borrowing and scraping to make the budget balance. So that, I think that is the biggest thing that will face the, uh, mm -hmm. the next Why do you budget. think that is? Have we been having oil and gas surpluses or, and uh, what, what's driven the surpluses and why are they evaporating in your estimation? Well, they're not evaporating now. I think they're beginning to evaporate. Uh, for, for example, the coal industry. Uh, we've had a period of time where uh, we've sold a lot of coal to China and India. Uh, and that is in large part because uh, a few years ago, a really bad storm basically knocked the Australian coal industry off the market. It's now back. So they're now competing uh, with, with us, with West Virginia, to sell coal to India and China, which is the biggest market for our coal and, and for theirs. That's one. Uh, you, I, I think that uh, uh, as, as uh, 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 and natural gas, while, while natural gas is picking up, there's hardly any employment in natural gas. Mm -hmm. That was one of the big advantages of coal for all the time, period of time that coal was, was king, uh, at least in, uh, in, in for, for much of the world. It employed a lot of people. Natural gas employs a few people drilling, a few people laying, laying pipelines. And once that happens, you only need two or three people around uh, to watch uh, uh, to watch natural gas coming out of the ground. So okay. we're, 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 we're gotten to a point where uh, we're, and we, we can depend on it for revenue, but uh, it's, it's, since it's not employing people, it doesn't have the people working that are then paying taxes. Okay. In. Let's yeah, dwell on that a little. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's oh, dwell ahead, a little ahead. more about the um, taxes. So, uh, of course, the, we're, everybody's interested in taxes and probably paying less taxes for sure. Um, so I saw on your website, I believe, you were talking about that if the personal income tax were eliminated, property tax would double. I'm not sure about that. But it does make some sense. I was wondering, you know, and I've been working on tax issues here locally. Like, do, would you support legislation to put a cap on the amount that property tax assessments can be raised in a given year? Let me give you an example. I know of a property, in fact, a property that I own where the, the uh, land value went up at literally 130 percent in one year so i thought this is abusive this allows for abuse and corruption the tax office here in Jefferson county claims that well first of all they even said well nothing to prevent us from raising it they claim that the land value went up 130 percent you know over anyway was increased in one tax year I know that many states have a cap on valuation, whether it be two, three, or five percent, or ten percent. So, what do you think about that? Should we cap raises? And you can also get back to the issue of property tax versus eliminating income tax if you want. Yeah, actually, those are, are together. Uh, 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 Richard, I would consider it, but here, here's the deal. Let, let's understand, uh, as, at least as I understand it. That, that 130% wasn't in one year, it was in three years. Because each person's real estate property is evaluated every three years. Okay. So you come back. So, so what they were telling you is that some things happen in the economy around here that increase the property value 130% over that three-year period. It just happened in that year they were, that they were up for having well, their Well, either taxes. way, it's an awfully large it increase. It is. No, you're right. I just I just want to make sure that that's uh, uh, everybody understood how it works. I think this not only would residential real estate taxes have to be doubled. I think they might it would be close to tripling in order to make up the deficit of eliminating the personal income tax. The personal income tax brings in now 40 percent of the total of the general revenue fund of the state. It was 45% uh, 
before the five, the 20 percent tax reduction that the legislature did three years ago. That knocked it down from 45 to 40. The rest of it comes from uh, sale, consumer sales taxes and taxes on business, which includes severance taxes, corporate income tax, that sort of thing. Uh, and I believe if you said to West Virginians, in order to do away with your income tax, we are going to have to at least double your residential real estate property tax, and probably more than that. I think the majority of West Virginians would say, no, I don't think I want to take that deal. Uh, so now, uh, I, I, I do think 130% is a whole lot in a short period of time. And so, uh, I, I, again, I don't know the facts in that particular case. Uh, it, it, it may be a case where uh, some of the circumstances of the property were changed during that three-year period. No. And at the same time, okay, you're saying no, and I'll, I'll, I'll take Man, the Many, I, because I've been researching it, many properties okay. in that area, in fact, basically all of them had similar increases on vacant land. And also here in Shenandoah, where I live, the year before, it also had astronomical increases, and other neighbors told me the same thing on land values. So something's definitely going on there. Okay. That's, uh, uh, even with all of this, West Virginia has just about the lowest residential real estate property taxes in the country. And that is based on a percentage of value. In other words, if I own a home that's valued right about $300,000. Uh, and so the property tax is based on a percentage that comes from that. It's a, a rather convoluted percentage, but that's what it's based on. If I, if I had the same home in just about every other state in the union, my residential real estate property taxes would be higher than they are. Uh, and, and I think West Virginians like that. It is one of the reasons that, that West Virginia has the highest percentage of home ownership in the country. That is one of the things where we're at the top of the list that's good. And I would like to keep that. So for that reason, uh, I would consider such a, a cap that you're talking about. I need to know more about it, but but I certainly will not reject that idea out of hand. Okay. Yeah, and it seems like, pop, you know, I kind of agree with you on the personal tax. I mean, people at the lower end of the incomes, <laughs> what do you say, brackets, maybe like <laughs> me and my wife, we don't, you know, you don't pay much personal income tax. I mean, you know, well, actually, maybe very little, practically nothing. But you sure pay property tax. It doesn't matter if you make one dollar or a hundred million dollars. You still got to pay property yeah. tax. So you could say, you know, in that the, sense, it's regressive. You're right. And, and part of the, part of the problem too is uh, that that if you don't, your home is not on a mortgage. You end up having to pay that at one fell swoop. Now, see, that, my, mine's part of my mortgage. So it's kind of like the income tax being withheld. I don't see it so much, uh, but it's. Uh, but you're right, a absolutely. It's. Uh, uh, I, I think particularly if we want to protect home ownership in our state, we have to be very careful about raising. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, property taxes. So this is a local, but also state issue. Like the, I know the school excess levy here is forty percent of our taxes, and as you know, it'll be on the ballot again to renew in 2026. I do think the legislature, well, you tell me what you think, made the right move in making it a little harder for the school to just keep coming back and ask for excess levies. And I should remind the viewers, because I was confused about it, you do pay school taxes anyway. They're mandatory under our state law, but the excess levy, or, so, or on the ballot it just says the levy, but it's the excess levy on your tax bill is in addition to that. And it's a whopping 40 percent, almost like 39 plus percent of our local taxes with very little transparency. Anyway, getting to the state level issue, you think it's good that now it has to appear on a primary or a general election ballot? Because before I know they could pretty much put the levy anytime they want. Do you have any opinion on that? Uh I, I think it's good that it's now 
at a regularly scheduled election. Yeah, I know that that uh, at times in the past, people like me who support public schools figured, oh, better chance of passing if we put it on the uh, uh, if we put it as a, as a special election. Uh, but there are times that backfired because what what can happen is if you happen to hit a period of time where people are upset with the school board about how they've spent the money and and there's a movement to oppose the levy, uh, then all it takes is a small number of people turning out at a special election to defeat the levy. So I think on balance, it's better to have it at a regularly scheduled election. Yes. OK. Uh, all right. Fair enough. Speaking of elections. Would, if elected, would you do anything to change or improve election integrity in West Virginia? Um, it may not be a hot button issue, but throughout the nation it certainly is. What I mean is a hot button issue like at the moment right here. But anyway, would you do anything to improve or ensure election integrity? I think we need to make voting easier for people. We have too many obstructions for American citizens to, to exercise their right to vote, and we need to make it easier for them to do so. Uh, I'm not all that concerned. I, I think there are, are enough safeguards baked into the system to ensure integrity. What we don't have is making it easy enough for everybody to vote. Well, let me challenge you a little on that. So I've I figured I've heard, you might. <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> I've heard. No, well, I know there's the argument that somehow, especially pe people who are a lower income or may perhaps minorities, somehow don't have an ID. I find that a little disingenuous. Like, you know, you're kind of saying, okay, you're a black person or other minority, Hispanic or whatever. Oh, you don't have an ID, like you can't get an ID. Come on. Is that really a sincere argument? Well, I don't think it is in West Virginia because we we yet don't require a photo ID. You can show up with a couple of pieces like a, a utility bill uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and it's a little bit different in West Virginia because since we're a rural state, almost everybody has a driver's license. There are places in the country where a whole lot of in big cities where people don't have driver's licenses. I don't mind requiring a photo ID if we are willing at taxpayers expense to furnish everybody with a photo ID. Yeah, OK. I mean, fair enough. I think, you know, that may that may be reasonable. What about the issue of illegals voting? So I think I was asking some of the second I was secretary of state candidates about this. Didn't get a clear answer. So. So by my understanding is like when you go to the MV, you can register to vote. And from what I've asked about, nobody is checking whether you're a citizen or not. So if you just say, yes, I'm a U.S. citizen, you'll be able to register to vote. Is that right? Shouldn't we check that only U.S. citizens are voting? Um, I think. I think there is a way that they check it. I'm not sure. But it's uh, it certainly it is against the law for non-citizens to vote, uh, and I think should be. Uh, but I think there's surely a way to do it without every time somebody wants to register to vote, saying, "Hey, are you a citizen?" That you, I would think, uh, w with your driver w when you apply for a driver's license, right. don't you have to prove your citizenship or at least show that you are a citizen or not? And I would think the DMV would have that information. I don't think so. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I know, I'm pretty positive, if any of the readers want to comment when I post this, that you, it said, I know that you can register to vote, and I'm pretty positive it says, are you a U.S. citizen? Of course, anybody can check the box that they're a U.S. citizen, whether they are or not. I don't think you have to show naturalization papers or anything like that. Um, I didn't have to show my birth certificate when I registered to vote the first time. I mean, I think they just accepted that I was a, I was a citizen. Right. So I think that's an issue. It's be, as you're well aware, it's become an issue now with the what 15 or is it 30 million people having crossed the border in the last four years and are 
you know, everywhere, including, of course, our own community. Um, yeah, I think that that only citizens should vote. So well, I agree with that. But but we've Richard, we've had waves of immigration in the past. You know, when when my Irish ancestors came here in the 1840s, there but that was legal immigration. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm a first generation American myself, but, but, but my parents didn't cross the border uh, just and claim they're here for asylum or whatever and whatever, you know. Well, we, we've had people claim asylum before, but, but here's the point I was going to get to. Uh, whether the immigrant is legal or illegal, if the person is not a citizen, they shouldn't vote. And the point I was going to be making is that all of these folks came here. They were not citizens until after they got here, went through the naturalization process. Uh, in many cases, it was only it was the second generation uh, that became citizens. There didn't seem to be a problem then. I think the system is equipped to take care of it. Hmm. Okay, that we might debate that, but let's move along. So you mentioned, I think, to summarize, you were saying, you know, balancing the budget was a number one issue, right? Yeah. So I, I want to pause it and see what you think about it. And I've talked to all candidates on both sides of the aisle about this, and pretty much everyone agreed, but I get your take. Do you think that really a driver of societal problems in general is like the breakdown of the two-parent male-female family, like right now in West Virginia, about almost 50 percent, or let's say to round it off, 50 percent of children are growing up in uh, not with not both parents or how do you say their parents? Single parent married, household. They're single parent families. Yeah. It, and we know that, you know, sociologically that that causes all kinds of increased risk factors for youth of all kinds you know, that play out in society. Would you agree with that, that that's, that's really um, the driver of societal problems, across uh, all kinds of problems? I would not agree that it's the driver. I would agree that it's a factor. But, but here's the, the uh, but part of the response has to be, what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. I am not going to vote for a law that bans divorce. I'm just not going to do it. Right. Uh, this should be up to individuals. And well, uh, societies ebb and flow, and, and we have to come up with ways to, to deal with the situation as it is. Yeah, but what about, so I think it's more an uh, education issue. A lot of the candidates agree with me that, you know, when you're educating, of course, parents should be educating. But as we know, a lot of children were saying almost 50 percent are growing up with grandpa or grandma or a single family or various situations. So point being, overall, if it's not, at, it should be at home, but also in schools and stuff, there is a, a well-known success formula, you know, don't have children until you're married, wait until you're 21 and have a job, graduate from high school. If you do all those things, you're virtually zero chance or 2% that you live in poverty. If you don't do any of those things, there's like an 80% chance. So it's striking. So as you, uh, as we've talked about before, I mean, I work in that area with youth education, encouraging that, but it's relatively inexpensive and simple to encourage that kind of behavior through education. And no, it does not have to be religious. Yes, it can be religious, but there's many sociological and beneficial reasons for that. Shouldn't we be encouraging our youth to do that? Uh, if you want to. Uh, the job of the legislature is to make laws. And again, if I'm elected to the legislature, I'm not going to vote for a law that makes somebody do something that they don't think they ought to do. I'm not going to vote for a law banning divorce. I'm not going to vote for a law saying that you have to have a two parent family. I just don't think that makes sense. Well, no, what, that, what that would, wouldn't what work. I, would support, I agree. What I would support is coming up with ways to deal with this situation, uh, to uh, so to, to make it easier for someone who is a single parent to be able to raise and educate his or her child. Okay, all right, uh, fair enough on on that. Um, so, 
what do you so anyway we'll get the, to uh differentiate for the audience how do you differentiate yourself you've said a number of things and um if you want to say anything i mean that do differentiate you but do you have anything particular you want to say in like juxtaposition to uh your opponent like and i should put out there that i think i want to also add um like, do you favor keeping, or do you like the Hope Scholarship? And um, I think I know the answer, but I'll let you speak on your own words on that, and if you and delve into that a little more, and your attitude toward like funding of education, if it should be choice, and any other ways you want to differentiate from your opponent, Patricia Rucker. First of all. I have great respect for Patricia Rucker. She is a delightful person. She is scrupulously honest. And she is a conscientious public servant. And I value her friendship. Uh, so the, any, any difference between Patricia and me is going to be on the issues. Uh, there are a number of points of departure on the issues, and one of which is uh, how, how we go about fulfilling the constitutional requirement, the state constitutional requirement for a thorough and efficient system of free schools, free meaning public. Um, I voted against the Hope Scholarship. Uh, I do not, it's a voucher. I don't like the idea of vouchers. I do believe that that train may have left the station. Uh, we may be uh, in it's it's may, maybe going to be part of what we deal with for many years to come if we're going to have vouchers. And the same thing applies to homeschooling. A, I don't want taxpayer money to go to people to send their kids to private school or to homeschool if that person can afford to, to do it themselves. Uh, if we're going to do it, it should go to people who could not afford to otherwise do it. Secondly, I do think we need much stronger controls, A, on the supervision of, of the parents and children that do it, and B, on how that money is spent. That was one of my big complaints when, when we first passed it. I remember I was on the House Education Committee when it came through, and, and uh, many of us said, wait a minute, you're going to give this $4,000 or whatever it is to somebody to go homeschool their child or send them to private school. Suppose they decide to buy a computer that they're going oh, to wait, use let me interject. It goes to the school. The tuition goes directly to the school you choose. Not if you're homeschooling. Okay. Anyway, continue. Sorry. But yeah. So <laughs> if somebody homeschools, suppose they buy a computer and they, and they say, this is for my kids' education and 90% of the use is for themselves. I don't think that's right. I just think that's an example. I just think they need, I think need that's to be tighter controls but go ahead. because it is a responsibility of the, of the legislature by the Constitution to make sure that everybody is educated, thoroughly educated. Okay. All right. So there's a, a difference. A different yes, case. there is a difference of opinion between Senator Rucker and me on yeah. that point. Yes. And I noticed on your site, you know, you're strongly for what you call reproductive rights. Most people would call freedom, re reproductive freedom, freedom, freedom. Reap would call abortion laws. But I think, you know, even as one who I, you know, I, I don't think you should murder babies in the womb. But even that, I don't think I think the focus on both both sides is wrong. I think it should be on education, like what I'm talking about. If you educate more young people, of course, again, the parents are the primary educators, but in general, societal too, like schools and so on, and societal expectations that you shouldn't have sex before marriage. You should bear children in marriage. And that, by the way, as we well know, and you're an older person, you know, like I am or older than I am, we well know that that used to be the expectation of society, then um, you're going to reduce, I would say, by about 80% the need for abortion. So for me, it's kind of mind-boggling that on both sides there isn't more emphasis on this. 
whether you believe you should be able to abort babies or not, why not emphasize more the education I'm talking about? Well, when you get to the point, Richard, where you say, where we say, you should, to me, that goes beyond education and into indoctrination. I'm, I'm, I'm 100% in favor of more education about birth control sex education, so that everybody understands the ramifications. But I do balk at the idea of saying, okay, given all this information, you should behave in a certain way. I'm, I think I, it's I, more, I, I, yeah, like I'm in that field. I would say it's more like these are the benefits. And, you know, if... if I don't mind that. And I, these I, are I the consequences, you know. Yeah. Whether it be STDs or HIV AIDS or a broken heart or increased chance of suicide. And by the way, I think you mentioned on your site you want to address the suicide epidemic. Well, by my knowledge, a big factor in that, especially among young people, girls who are sexually active are six times more likely to attempt suicide. So it goes along with, you know, mental and physical health to be abstaining because when you're into the more risk behavior so no of course you can't it's not so much moralizing like you should do this you should do that no these are the consequences these are the benefits that's how we do it in our program i am all in favor of a thorough education on that issue and all others yeah okay we, by the way we the one difference is with our program and like so-called comprehensive sex ed we don't em we talk about how effective birth control is, but we don't emphasize in the sense of we don't get like a plastic penis and put it up there and says, now put on the condom. But we do talk about it. So, well, I think we spent time talking about a number of issues. Of course, there are many others. So I want to just let you say anything else. Oh, uh, let me ask you one more thing, though, before we get to that sure. final wrap up. The solar farm issue. Now, I notice it seems like our county is trying to, I've looked at some of the comprehensive plan discussion. I don't see much about changing the solar farm, uh, what do you say, matter of right or whatever you want to call it. Do you agree that it's a, a matter of right, quote unquote, to like have solar farms? And I know that I believe you oppose that kind of legislation, which fortunately didn't pass. But do you have anything to say about that? And then maybe wrap up with anything else you want to talk about. Yeah, actually, Richard, thank you for permitting me to plug my column in the Shepherdstown Chronicle, which will come out tomorrow, in which I come out and say, we have to do away with this nonsense of by right and call it zoning. If, it, if, you, if you have a right to do something, then that means you're not subject to zoning. Uh, and, if, and if you say that a particular thing can be done in every zoning district by right, You've destroyed zoning. Now, and and, and I, I do believe in zoning, and, and and this is not an issue that is going to confront the legislature. Uh, it is true that that both Senator Rucker and I opposed a bill that would have exempted these industrial solar plants from local zoning. Uh, but that it, it, you know, it's up to then the county planning commission to do it. I do think the Jefferson County Planning Commission has not imposed sufficient uh, restrictions on those things, but that's up to them. Um, at any rate, the idea of zoning is this. I accept certain limitations on my right to do with my property as I will in order to be guaranteed that my neighbor does not do something with his or her property that damages the value of my property. And we all sit down and, and agree on what is a good use of land in a particular area of the county. And to me, it, it makes sense. Uh, but um, at any rate, yeah, I, I think that uh, the comprehensive plan needs to be, I think they need to send it back to the drawing board and start over. Even though it means they're not, they would not meet the deadline, the supposed deadline of January 1, I think they need to send it back, start over, have more public hearings, be more transparent about it than they've been. Uh, so there. Yeah, because I was trying to comment on that. 
on one of the, like they said, oh, comment on this map. And there's a map you're supposed to click. And I tried to click on the solar <laughs> farm and put bike solar farm, but, you know, we got rid of this abomination. I did put something on there, but they made it so there wasn't really, it wasn't easy. And I, it seems like none of the questions they asked were about that. So I think you're right. It was kind of non-transparent. There was a pre preset agenda that that wouldn't be discussed or as much right. as possible. Okay, as that's we wrap right. up. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. I said that's right. I agree with yeah. you there. Any, just anything else you want to bring attention to about your candidacy for the uh, state Senate? No, I think we've covered all the issues and I appreciate the time. Uh, I hope that people will seriously consider my candidacy and, and uh, I, I would love it if you would vote for me, you and everybody else listening. Okay, thank you so much for your time today. I will uh, uh, look forward to talking with you and working on these issues regardless of Whoever wins election, let's keep this conversation going. And thanks yes, for joining I, today. Yeah, th there are three states that use the term House of Delegates for the lower house. They're all right here, uh, West Virginia, Maryland, and Virginia. Okay, well, thanks again and uh, appreciate it. You take care and thank you for having me. Okay, we'll put this out on our podcast and website.